recording live from somewhere. This is Zach Couples back, bringing another Movement Debrief, episode number 23, in fact. And we got a doozy for you tonight, fam. We got all types of wild and crazy things to talk about today. So what? I'm glad you asked. So today we're going to talk about, um, hang on, I got to fix something with this mic, I think. Or I just got to talk real loud. We'll talk loud. So we're going to talk about the IT ban and all types of bullshit related to that. We're going to talk about how did you should decide and plan your training and your learning. And lastly, we're going to talk about structure, function, and pathology. But before that, a little bit of housekeeping. Did you guys see my blog last night? Wait, no, on Monday. I'm thrown off, fam. Um, so Monday's blog was a link to a post I did for iFast University, which I'll put a link to that in the show notes in tomorrow's post. And uh, we basically kind of talked about my approach, my model, how I'm currently thinking about things, doing things. And um, yeah, that was pretty much it. So uh, really good time. Had some good questions from young Lance, so I was pretty um, happy to be um, have the opportunity to work with him and talk about what I do, and it was very cathartic for me because it helped me kind of sort out some stuff. So uh, did that, and of course I got back on Tuesday from the land of China, and uh, man, uh, absolutely phenomenal trip. Phenomenal trip. Um, I gave three talks in two cities. So I first well, I landed in Shanghai, but then I went to Taihuyen and uh, spoke for about four hours there on some breathing, which I'm hoping to re-record and put out um, copies of for my newsletter subscribers. So hint, hint, you should probably subscribe to my newsletter if you want that stuff. Um, so we did breathing. We did a talk then in Changzhou on pain and where... Um, current research is with that regard and um, believe it or not it's a little bit different than some of the the Butler Mosley fair at least in the way that I've read the literature and the way I think about things so um, you're gonna be want to want to be on the lookout for that as well and then we just kind of talked about my model of improving movement variability and so um, that was those are my talks but I mean uh, really good food uh, what you eat in China stays in China so I won't talk too much about that but um, the people were unbelievable. I mean, just uh, incredible hospitality. They, they treat you like a rock star. And I mean, it's it's really amazing the connections you can make with people when you don't speak the same language. I mean, it just it was kind of eye opening for me in terms of how how much really nonverbal communication matters and is important. Um, so it was awesome. What was not awesome was the air quality. Um, it's very sad to see how bad the pollution is in the land of China. Um, but, um, I mean, it, it's just a really cool place. And uh, yeah, yeah, there's a lot of other neat little things. I won't dive too much into that um, much more. But um, you ever get a chance to go, like, check it out. I mean, it's just, yeah, I, 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 I hope I get the opportunity to go back someday. But um, that's that in terms of my life. Guys, again, 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 put it on your calendars, September, I believe it's 16th and 17th of 2018. It's going to be in Seattle, Washington, and we're going to give it two day. What's it going to be about? It's going to be about the model, guys, but from a physical activity lens, most likely. So we'll talk about knowledge, we'll talk about variability, we'll talk about power, we'll talk about capacity, we're going to talk about all those things across two days, I think, unless I decide to just go all into one. So that's um, up on the forefront Otherwise, I don't think anything else is up in the forefront. So, uh, yeah, just put that on your calendars, guys. Uh, Michael Lee's going to be talking about that pretty soon once I tell him what I'm talking about. All right. That's all I got for housekeeping. So let's debrief, shall we? So first question. Um, this was a question asked when I was in the land of China. And um, it was regards to the iliotibial band. And so the question was in relation to the Ober's test. Because I blew some minds in the land of China and told them that the Ober's test being a test of iliotibial band tightness was complete bullshit. 
because it is, and I'll tell you why. So um, she asked, okay, well, so what then do you do for iliotibial band tightness? And so first off, let's, let's put this to rest right now. So there's a study, I'll link it in the show notes. Um, it's called the anatom an anatomic investigation of the Obers test. And so what they did with the Obers test was they took a bunch of cadavers and they cut out various parts of the anatomy to determine, hey, what is going to favorably impact the Obers test? And so um, what they cut first was the iliotibial band. So they cut it out. It's gone. And they performed the Obers test maneuver on these cadavers. And guess what? There was absolutely zero change in range of motion. So, one, it seems as though at least the Obers test is not a test of iliotibial band length. So there's that. Then what else they did, though, to change the test was quite interesting. So then they proceeded to cut out the glute med one, and then separately they cut out the posterior capsule of the hip. Guess what? They cut out those structures and rechecked the Obers test with the iliotibial band intact. We had improvements in motion. So, what is the IT or what is the Obers test looking at? Well, I'm glad you asked. Probably more likely structures that limit frontal plane adduction. So, glute med. So, we're probably looking at posterior capsule. We're probably looking at lateral femoral cutaneous nerve of the thigh. I mean, it's just like, what are all the potential mechanisms that could limit that motion? Dan DiBernardi, indeed, Damon. Oh, man. Those were the days. Uh, Damon is a dear friend of mine who, had, who, who ran the 4x800 with me in high school. Um, however, he, he ran against me in college and uh, didn't end well. Bam! Um, so, anyways, uh, so, the, so you got structures that would limit a deduction. And, and not only that, but also would limit hip extension because you have to be able to effectively pull the individual back into full hip extension um, before you can even, even test a deduction. And so I don't think that the Obers test is something we have to throw out because, well, there's all this talk that you can't stretch the IT band, so on and so forth. It's like, well, maybe the test is still effective, just not for the reasons we initially thought, which is probably going to be true of most everything we do in physical therapy. Manual therapy is a prime example of that. Uh, in the early days, Back in the day, we used to think that manual therapy was impacting the structures of the tissues and mobilizing the joint. <laughs> There's no such thing as the iliotibial band syndrome, fam. Trust me, Damon. But um, I, I mean, we you know we we thought with manual therapy we're blame or you know we're moving joints, we're breaking up scar tissue, we're doing all of this stuff. And if you look at some of the studies on modern mechanisms of manual therapy, well, that's simply false. Now, did that mean that manual therapy wasn't effective? No, I mean, it, manual therapy in the right context, for the right person at the right time, I mean, manual therapy aiders, is effective. And there's some research supporting for that on various conditions. So just because the test may not do what we think it does, doesn't make it not useful if that makes sense. So I think that the Obers test is incredibly useful. It's just not an iliotibial band test. Now, is there any interventions we can do to stretch an iliotibial band, or is there any indication that we could potentially favorably impact the iliotibial band? I don't think so. And the reason why is because the iliotibial band is a very dense structure of fascia, connective tissue, all that. And if you look at the mechanical deformation of fascia, I believe is the study, and I'll link that in the notes. But what they did was they designed this model to see, well, how much force do we have to input to deform fascia? And it was well over, I think, a ton or ten, a thousand newtons or whatever. But it was a substantial amount that we couldn't do with our hands to deform the fascia 1%. 1%. So you mean to tell me that we have some type of intervention that's going to um, alter the iliotibial band, and I just don't think that that's the case. 
I question how often it is a nociceptive generator. Now, it may be just because there's some nerves, but it's like you have the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve over there. You have vastus lateralis right underneath it. You have all these other structures that can limit adduction. So uh, point being is I don't think we're treating the IT band with a lot of these things. The Overs test is still a very important test for me. It's one of my biggest tests in terms of clinical decision making because it appreciates frontal plane and sagittal plane capabilities of the lumbopelvic area. So you should probably do it. You should probably intervene in such a manner that it's attacking the areas that you need to attack, such as hip flexors and um, hip abductors and, and posterior hip musculature. So that's my spiel on that. Next question. Also from a gentleman in the land of China who spoke pretty good English. I'm sad I didn't get his name. But he asked this. He said, Zach, you've been to blah, 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 a number of courses, which I just counted recently, and uh, I think the number's up to 86. It's a lot. Um, I really got to stop that. But um, he said, you've been to a lot of courses. How do you go about, how, or how should I go about deciding what classes I should take and how I should structure my system and my model? I thought that was an awesome question. Awesome question, because um, there's a lot of stuff out there, guys. Um, I've taken 86 classes, and not all of them have been worthwhile. Some have been completely worthless. Some have been immensely helpful. Some have just given me pieces to the, the puzzle. And what, what I told the man, and I tell you beautiful, sexy people, is this. The first thing you have to do is find whatever learning avenues you can to develop a a system, a framework, and principles, which I kind of meld together as one, because you have principles that you abide by that govern your your critical thinking analyses and your 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 framework. You know, if this, then this, then this, then this. And that's going to be important because it allows you to make good clinical decisions, one, but two, it also helps you make good critical thinking decisions when you're exposed to classes that maybe don't fit your model yet. Maybe they won't, but maybe they will. And so if you, you have good principles that help the people you work with, I think that's top priority. And it gives you, um, you know, also developing a framework from which you, you operate and make clinical decisions or performance decisions is incredibly important. So. You need to find things and ways that are going to help you design that. You got to lay the foundation first before you throw other stuff on top of it. So that's where I said start your learning. After that, you have to ask yourself, where are the holes in my game? What problems do I need to solve? And who am I not helping that I should be able to help? So let's let's dive into each of those again. So first one is where are the holes in my game, which they all kind of go hand in hand. But what areas do you feel like you're not doing as well as you could in? Maybe maybe you're not the best at coaching exercise, or maybe your hands are not that great, um, and maybe you feel like you could do better in those areas. Well, then target your continuing education in such a manner that that helps you there. Um, also. What problems are you trying to solve? And this is not just clinical problems, but this is just life problems. Like, what do you struggle with in in life? You know, what what type of population at your or what problems does your clinic have or the place that you work that need help? And can you structure your learning in such a manner that you address those? So, I mean, that's another thing that we have to consider is like what what we're really trying to do, what what the purpose of us. As, as people is to to solve problems and to to create value for people. Um, Jan 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 Dady, I hope I pronounced you right. Um, I will ask I will answer your question right after I finish this little dialogue. Um, so, what problems am I trying to solve? Create purpose, create meaning, and solve those problems. Last thing would be 
um, who am I struggling with patient wise? Maybe you are terrible working with hands for an example. And so maybe you go to a hand therapy course, which is something that I did. Um, so that's kind of how I structure my learning is build the system first. So then you can make basic decisions on that, fill the holes that may be limited from um, after you've built your system and then ask yourself what problems still need to be solved and who do I not help as well as I could. And I think if you do that and you operate from that framework, you'll be in business. So um, we got a live question from Jan, Jan Dady. Jan Dady asks, poor hip internal rotation bilaterally when the patient is lying supine, where do I go then with them? Yes. So um, Jan, here's my next question. Is the down leg extended or is it flexed? And we'll just wait and see what happens. And also I would ask you, because that does matter, that does matter. And also I would ask you, what do the other tests look like? So what does, what does, what does this patient look like in the sagittal plane? What does this person look like in the frontal plane? So I think if you answer those questions, that can help me a little bit more. Um, because here's what I would say about limitations in hip IR. First off, if you want to make the hip IR limitations appear worse when you're testing in supine, straighten the bottom leg. And here's why I think this is. Because you'll notice a difference if you test hip internal rotation with the bottom leg extended versus, say, in hook lying, you will get different numbers. And I think that the numbers are a bit more accurate, I would say, in the seated position, first and foremost. Um, and the reason why that is is because the pelvis is in an even position when you have both hips in the, the same position. If one leg is down, that may have a tendency to, that hip extension on that side may have a tendency to create extension in the pelvis or an anterior pelvic tilt. And if you dip into anterior pelvic tilt, that can create a limitation in hip internal rotation. And so um, it becomes much more challenging to make yourself think that, wow, man, I, I really need to improve this hip IR. But it's like, well, maybe if you address pelvic positioning or the orientation of the pelvis, then you, um, you, know, you might get a favorable improvement. What's up, Ori? How are you living? So um, that's one thing to consider first. I would check I generally favor checking the hip rotation and sitting because it does keep the, the, the pelvi, the iliums, the anominates a little bit more um, even. Now that said, where do you go from there? The, the treatment hierarchy is always the same until it's not the same. But you know, ask yourself, do you have sagittal plane of the hips? Um, actually, before that, do you, do you have rib cage positioning? I would say, because if you don't have rib cage positioning, it's going to be very hard to get someone into a relatively neutral pelvic position or out of anterior pelvic tilt. So you want to look and make sure that you have sagittal plane, not just at the pelvis, but also at the, at the rib cage and the thorax. After that, then it's like, okay, do you have full straight leg raise? Do you have hip extension? If you don't, then you probably need to go into some type of posterior pelvic tilt activity to restore that. Get them out of an anterior pelvic tilt. But let's say you clean that up and you still got someone who's got a hip IR limitation bilaterally. You still have someone who um, maybe they can't adduct the hips. Like in the Obers test I just talked about, where do you go from there? I think there's a couple ways you can do this. If I have bilateral limitations, one thing you may consider is checking like a like the functional squat test that PRI likes, or like a toe touch to squat, and see if they can dip all the way down into that position. Because um, if they can, then then that if they can't, first off. It might be a good way to increase a little bit of opening of the pelvic outlet because the pelvic outlet has to open and the posterior hip has to be able to relax in order to descend all the way into a squat. 
And so that's one thing you can consider doing is squatting these individuals who have limitations in hip IR. Next thing you consider after that is some type of unilateral type um, posterior hip stretch. And I'm not talking about just driving hip IR, but I'm talking about, and hopefully you guys can see this, doing something where you're pushing the hip back if it's my left side so I can get a stretch into the posterior capsule. And um, in the show notes, I can show a video of that. But that's kind of where I would go with someone who has hip IR limitations, first and foremost, is you, before you go femurs, address pelvis. Um, well, before and before you go pelvis, address axial skeleton and rib cage. If you still got limitations after that, then you may have to go into some type of manual stretching, which sometimes is very much indicated with limitations in hip rotation, specifically IR. Um, so I like doing things where I'm gliding the hip into a posterior glide and trying to drive IR that way. That seems to be pretty good. Occasionally, I'll do low load, long duration stretching to restore IR. But I will say this, the, the people who, like, I'm thinking that that's the fix, I just, I've rarely seen it work. I've rarely seen it work. I presume they need hamstrings with ribs down. Um, yes, that's, that's what I would do. Because, the, so, Jan commented and said, yeah, the ribs are flared, and I presume they need hamstrings with the ribs down. And so, what you're doing is you're creating a posterior pelvic tilt, both from the proximal portion of the pelvis and the distal. So if you can use the obliques and, and the, the transverses of abdominis to create a little bit of a posterior pelvic tilt, one, and then two, you get the hamstrings to further reinforce that uh, distally, then you got a fighting chance at getting posterior pelvic tilt, uh, which, which should open up some, some hip motion in the other planes. Now, one other thing to consider with the low, low, long duration stretching, as I was talking about previously, is I've, I've rarely seen it work. And I don't know if it's because maybe I didn't do enough durations, but it's like I've, I've had people do 20 minutes, or maybe I don't have the right stretch, but the, the people who I've had try that have had such limitations in IR that I don't know if it's just, which will segue into our next talk, but uh, like a structural adaptation that just can only be fixed surgically if we want to restore that or it's just the tone is too much to overcome. I mean, I really just don't know. And, and those patients are kind of my, like if there's one thing I don't wish upon anyone, it's to have such limitations in IR that you're not getting anywhere. Um, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, it's just, it doesn't seem like, it hasn't seen for, from, from my standpoint to be very effective. And I've had buddy, like one of my good buddies, He's got limitations in hip IR and was like spent a good year trying to restore internal rotation. I mean, and like dedicated as all hell, like spending 45 to 60 minutes a day doing this, squatting, doing posterior capsule stretching or posterior hip stretching, whatever the heck we're stretching. And got some improvement, but it was still quite minimal. So. Um, and again, though, it's like, you know, so you're, you're driving IR, it's like, how much internal rotation do you need? What are you trying to do? <laughs> that's, that's the, the big question is, I, you know, I think we go down one, one mistake that we make when we're working with people is we try to improve these qualities to the nth degree, whether it's range of motion or variability or whether it's really anything, and you, you have to consider what the demands are that that person needs to have and give them just enough to, to meet those demands. And maybe there's other qualities that you need to improve upon to uh, have them reach their goals. You know, someone who predominantly operates in the sagittal plane, like maybe a powerlifter or a sprinter, maybe, maybe they don't need to be able to achieve full shoulder internal rotation. I don't know. I mean, that's... That's the thing. It's like, that's what makes it kind of tough is you, the amount of these qualities that people need is very much idiosyncratic. Restoring variability in one person could be life changing and another could be completely benign. So we really are operating with a lot of uncertainty in this regard. 
in terms of making these uh, adjustments with, with people. Now, do I think we're going to break people? I don't think uh, with with the modalities that we have were that were, were that strong or important. But um, um, I mean, you can still at least at least try to improve these things. So it's kind of getting a little rambly. But point being is, um, you know, when you have hip internal rotation limitations, get sagittal plane, sagittal plane, and, and rib cage first. Then get your frontal plane, and then go after transverse. And you want to use squatting and, and push your hip stretching to achieve that. How much do you need? As much as they need to meet the tasks that their life demands. So that's that. Last question. This is a combo question. It's from my girl who's listening on Facebook, Lucy Hendricks. Shout out to you. Um, she's awesome. And uh, I, I really enjoy working with her. So you guys should check her out at Enhancing Life and, and Dark Side Strength. Um, I'm going to link that in the show notes. Get you some peeps your way, Lucy, since you send so many peeps my way. Um, so she and then the, this other cat in the land of China asked a couple questions relating to a few things that I think would meld well together. And so Lucy's question was about, you know, if if in some of my testing, if I would expect a limitation and it, it, it isn't there, is there pathology present? So is something stretched out or, is, you know, is laxity developed or is there a structure that's damaged? Something along those lines. And then the guy in, in the land of China asked me, you know, do physical therapists, do we change structure or are we more focusing on function. And so I think these kind of all three go hand in hand. And so I'm going to try to unpack this. First question, or the first thing I will say is I think us as, as not just as physical therapists, but as, as strength coaches, or if we're working at intervening on people to meet their health and performance goals from a movement standpoint, it's mostly function whatever that means. I don't think the only, the only time I think we can really change structure is through hypertrophy of things and, and time is, is when we can get adaptations of structural things. But predominantly what we're changing is, is movement, is function, is movement patterns, is someone's movement capabilities, is someone's movement capabilities under load, these types of things. And a lot of those are more neurologically driven as opposed to structurally driven. Um, hang on. Jan80 re-asked the question. Cheers, mate. Person in question feeling totally lopped up around his hips, plays soccer. Thanks, Mill. Jan, I appreciate your question, man. Um, thank you so much for contributing. I'm going to give you a shout-out too, fam. Respect. So I think we address function more than anything. We can improve movement capabilities. We can improve power. We can improve many things that are related to our neurological wiring. And really the only structural adaptations we can make are those that occur through the training process over time. And I think rarely is this the case in the rehab side because we just, you know, in most cases you simply don't see people for that long unless it's a post-operative case. But even then, it's like, are we, are we truly inducing changes in the tissues or is it are we just creating a, a safe healing environment for the tissues that were repaired to heal? And I don't know the answer to that. You know, I don't know if we enhance the, the healing process or if we can enhance tissue properties in such a manner that we get a change. So um, I, I think movement and, and function is is the, the biggest thing that we're going to be improving. Now in terms of the pathology case, now sometimes with your testing and, and based on some of the algorithms that maybe PRI has or, or some of the things that you know you see, you may expect certain limitations to be present, but then they're not. And so the question is how do they get there? Is there some type of ligamentous laxity? Is there some laxity of the tissues? Is there some pathology develop? And the answer is I don't know, right? Because I, I question 
with a lot of the testing that we do that what it what it really means like what are we really really looking at because a lot of these things can change incredibly quickly and I don't know if you can see changes in tissue properties of like maybe capsules or things like that change that quickly or if we're really moving the bones in such this position that you know you eliminate bony blocks or if we can even get to the point like when we're testing lower trunk rotation that we can appreciate iliolumbar ligament laxity and it's like I don't how do we know this because that's not the only thing that we moved when we performed a task all the tissues that are involved in that movement move so it could be anything in that regard that's either not allowing a movement to occur or allowing a movement to occur and it's likely the combination of factors that allow that I mean, back to the iliotibial band example or the obers test example it's like is it the iliotibial band well based on the anatomy probably not but maybe fascis lateralis plays a role maybe posterior capsule plays a role maybe the posterior hip muscles play a role maybe a lot of things play a role maybe pelvic positioning maybe this lateral femoral continuous mirror maybe it's all, all these things and i think we get hung up a lot of times on the 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 tissue that's either compromised or at fault and I don't think that that's can be a fruitful endeavor and I think we have to be okay operating with uncertainty because a lot of a lot of the stuff that we do not just in the rehab realm but in the performance realm doesn't have great evidence and we're always working with a different person and I I, I could reason to believe that I can have two people who have full motion where they shouldn't, but for completely different reasons. You know, I saw a woman today who, like, she is just incredibly gumby and loosey-goosey. And, uh, like, to a very high degree, and is probably biting hypermobility. Um, you know, I didn't check that, but, like, I would reason to believe just based on her quality of movement that this is the case. Whereas I've seen other people walk in with similar freedom of movement but that's not necessarily the case like it doesn't doesn't have the same feel when you take it through range and it's like do these both people have ligamentous laxity and it's like i don't know because it feels different so the point being is i don't think we need to worry about what specific tissues are involved i think we need to appreciate how an individual moves from a in, a tot in totality and fill in the voids of what they can't do first off and then if they can do something when they shouldn't retrain that in a safe manner and if that's the case then it's likely that pathology and structural changes don't matter when they do matter is in in the case of some type of traumatic incident or traumatic injury so for example my boy when i were hooping with Dolph with uh, my boy champ who's darn he's not listening in but um and first off i won the first game killed killed him i am nasty from three-point land um thank you to coach bob tate for for teaching me how to shoot but he went up to go do a layup and he went up with his right and tried to do an underhook and went left and all of a sudden his shoulder dislocated that's a structural problem that needs to be addressed by someone who can deal with structures and that might be a physician or whoever i think it was a pa who, who put his back into place but um point being is like those those are the type of structural or pathological findings that are more concerning having someone with a little bit more mobility than they should have not as concerning you just have to teach them how to control and coordinate that and i think that that's probably a good stopping point for tonight Thank you guys so much for tuning in. It's good to be back home talking to you beautiful, sexy people. And I bet you're wondering where you can find more. Well, I'm glad you asked. First off, check me out, ZachCouples.com. I would, while you're there, do a few things. You should subscribe to my newsletter. You'll get a free acute chronic workload calculator. You'll get weekend learning goodies every Friday. You'll get access to some of my talks and other free things that peeps who don't subscribe don't get. So you should check out the newsletter. Also, while you're there, I offer services to help you beautiful people. So if you are not moving as well as you like, and maybe you've had pain, and you checked it out, and 
you know, there hasn't seemed to be anything from an MD standpoint that's helpful, or maybe you've failed PT, and you need a fresh set of eyes, let these baby blues take a look at you. Um, I've had quite a few people come back. I've been very fortunate to work with some great people in terms of coaches and stuff like that. So, like, I have to give big kudos to, to Dave Rasco, to Lucy Hendricks, and to Andy McCloy because they've been incredible for letting me work with their people. And so I also do some collaboration with trainers. So if you've got clients, guys, who you know, maybe you don't have a PT around the area that's that, that you can refer to confidently, let me be your guy. I'd be happy to help. So there's that. I also offer mentorship. So I just uh, mentored with uh, one of my buddies today. After, uh, we had a great session. And um, for that, I basically help, help you work through some problems you may be having, whether it's in the clinic, whether it's in the performance realm. And, and we, just, we just get stuff done and make things happen. So check me out there. Also, I offer online training. If you're post-rehab, trying to lean out and get some of the, you know, get, get that six-pack going. Or maybe you're an athlete and you want to perform a little bit better. Hit me up for some online training. I'll take care of you, fam. So those are some of the three services that I offer at my site. Stay tuned. We're going to put out some more stuff eventually. Next, you should follow me on Facebook. Facebook.com forward slash Z Couples. You can also search Zach Couples PT. That is my Facebook page. You can read some reviews of some people who've worked with me and see what they think. So I just so you guys know I'm not BSing you. We also got that Instagram, baby. Instagram.com. Zach, Z-A-C, couples. Check me out there. I post all types of cool stuff on Instagram. And then last but not least, Twitter. Actually, that's not last but not least. But I'm also on Twitter. Twitter.com. My handle is at Z couples. And then last but not least, you can find me on YouTube. Just search Zach Couples um, and you'll find me. Otherwise, thank you all for tuning in. You people stay wonderful. Keep it real, but not to the extent where things go wrong. Stay hungry, stay learning, stay moving, and I'll see you next time. Deuces!